Very good. <laughs> very, very good. And <laughs> you speak about efficient formulation of two dimensional geometrical exact variability. So please. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Thank also, you. Mark is like, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so. so thank you once again for, for the introduction and also for the invitation. And let me jump directly. Control my presentation. Okay. Let me jump directly into motivation of our work on geometrical exact fittings. So we would like to design some kind of material or in modern kind of language meta material with controllable properties. So you can imagine that we want to have a material with a very low mass, a slight weight, but with very high stiffness or with some extreme stiffness just in some directions. Oh, yeah. So, I also brought some uh, requisites with me so you can see what we want to do because we can use uh, 3D printing to really like uh, create such kind of material. So, we, we have uh, typically some uh, uh, representative volume element or representative element like the hexagon in this case, and uh, we combine it to create a bigger bigger structure. And in our case, uh, we would like to insert uh, some beams that can get into contact to change the behavior of the structure. And uh, to show, show you that, I brought uh, some video printed specimen. So I will send them to you so you can play with that to see what you can get. So these are the unit cells. <laughs> and then we would like to assemble the cells into like bigger, bigger specimen that would rep represent the macroscopic material. So, and uh, as you can see, the elastic deformations is very large in this case. Yeah? So I can really compress the, the cell to so you can see really the deformation and after I release the load, it, it returns to its optimal shape. Yeah? And if I compress it in some special direction, the contact is activated and the, some additional mechanism is activated there and the stiffness for them increases. And so we can, we can get different behavior, for example, in one direction than in like one shear or in the opposite, opposite shear in terms. And uh, we would like to really design such kind of structure so you can see that the orientation of these contact uh, beams can be can be different in different in different points of, or different locations. And to do that, uh, we need some let's say efficient computational technique. Of course, we can use uh, like let's say three D finite element method with contact that would, that would be really computational heavy. And because we would like to do some optimization of that, we would need to run this uh, over and over to, to be able to find out the optimal uh, location of the contact and its position and, uh, and so on. So to do that, we decided to really start from, uh, from the beginning, from the formulation of simple nonlinear being. As, as you can see, really the deformations can be really, really huge. So we need to have lots of theory of beams. And uh, we started from that. So we have some basic kinematics uh, assumptions or kinematic description of, a, of behavior of, of, of geometry of the beam. So you can imagine that you have a beam of a length L uh, with cross-section that is uh, you know, as uh, H, it's uh, in the Z direction. And, uh, uh, the line that connects the uh, centroids of the different cross-section, it's uh, x is for x. And then uh, we have two deformation quantities or displacement quantities of points on the center line, and they are called us, that's a displacement in the direction of x, and the ws, it's a deflection or it's a displacement, displacement in the direction of the axis. So this is 
to just try the center line, but then we would like to uh, see where, let's say, in a general in a generic point of the cross sections uh, move. So this can be uh, described by these geometry or uh, equations that are based just on the planarity of, of the beam. So we assume that the beam after the function remains flat. Uh, then we can we can express some deformation quantities, which is a stretch. So we 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 work just in one dimension, so this is in fact like a deformation gradient, but it's just in one dimension, so we have just one stretch. So lambda s is a stretch of the center line that can be computed from us and ws and from the, the, the relative that are the displacement from the displacements of the center line, and then uh, the stretch of a generic point. At an allocation of the cross section can be avoided using this equation. And finally, we arrive uh, at the expression for stretch using the center line stretch plus P prime, that, that is a rotation for the cross section. Yeah. So, uh, in these uh, kinematic quantities, there is also phi that, that denotes the rotation of the cross section. So, we have two uh, displacement and one rotation. And P prime, in fact, is a curvature. So uh, the stretch of the generic point of the procession is it's ex expressed as a stretch of the center line plus z times uh, the picture. So its distribution uh, along the, the cross section is clean. Moreover, because uh, you can see that uh, the, the beams we have here are very slender. So we use so-called navier bernoulli hypothesis that uh, tells us that uh, it means that uh, the cross sections that are perpendicular to the sub center line before deformation remains perpendicular to the center line even after the deformation. And using this uh, assumption, we can express sine and cosine of our rotation using the relative of displacement of the center line and the stretch of the center line. And I will use this equation later. So. Uh, to the government equation. Then we, of course, need some constitutive law that describes the behavior of the material. And so it gives us, uh, let's say, relation between stresses and strains. Uh, here we use, oh, and this is like, a, let's say, modeling assumption. And so as a, as a starting point, we, we use uh, this kind of uh, energy or energy density. Uh, which leads to relation between stress that is denoted here as a sigma and, and the stretch. And in fact, stretch minus one, it's what we call bi bio uh, strength. Yeah. Uh, e, it's a modulus, so it's a property of the material. And this stress is more conjugated with, uh, with this strength, with this bio strength, but in fact, because we work in 1D, it's first the okay, stress, because th this is like information data. And then we can substitute for lambda from the previous slide, and we end up uh, with this formulation. So we see that again, also uh, the first the okay, of stress and also the bio strength, they are distributed uh, in a linear fashion along the intersection. In the beam theory, we usually work with some uh, res stress resultant. The first one is just an integral of the stress uh, over, over the cross-section area, and it's called a normal force. So if we substitute this term here, we end up with this formulation. So A is the cross-section area, we say B. Is young models and uh, lambda s minus one is the bio strain. And uh, the moment that it's calculated as an integral of sigma times uh, z, and then again, when we substitute it, we get ei, where e is again the modulus, and i is a, it's a moment of inertia. And kappa, uh, I repeat again, it's a, it's a curvature. Yeah, so then you can use, for example, the minimum of uh, potential energy. Uh, to derive a constitutive equation, oh, sorry, equilibrium equations. So you get two equilibrium equations uh, where involved that there is normal force, uh, bending moment, uh, rotation, and uh, stretch of, of the center line. 
So these are our equilibrium equations of uh, geometric uh, exact uh, exact field. Also, the equilibrium equation they, they, they can be derived from a free body diagram. And in fact, what we can do, we can integrate them and uh, derive uh, this kind of uh, equilibrium equations where xab and zab are, uh, let's say, integration constants and they, they correspond to left hand uh, internal forces xab, zab. And W A, because then when we calculate the moment, uh, the moment we, we, we have to integrate one once more. So we have uh, some more constant and W A and uh, U A, they have the displacement at uh, the left hand. So now we can combine all, all these equations to, to arrive at the governing equation for ORP. And so let me remind that. So the first one is just the division of a, of a curvature as a derivative of a rotation. And then we have two equations that, that corresponds to this navier bernoulli hypothesis, as, as I introduced it at the beginning. Then we have, uh, like, let's say, invariant constitutive law. So we know how kappa is calculated from, from, from amp and how the bio strain of the, of the central line is calculated from the normal force and from some uh, geometrical and uh, material characteristics. And then we have. Uh, two sets of uh, <clears throat> equilibrium equations. Eh? So, so basically, we take these three equations, we substitute there from O kappa uh, for lambda s. Also, then we can substitute uh, lambda s is epsilon s mi minus. Oh, sorry, uh, lambda s is epsilon s plus one. So we can substitute for epsilon s, and then we have substitute here for m and n, and we have at this three uh, three. Uh, Equation of the first order. Uh, in fact, the structure of these equations is uh, quite, quite nice because, or maybe let's say special, because when you, when you look at, at the left hand, there is phi prime, US prime, and US prime. But for example, when we want to calculate phi prime, there is no, there is no phi on the right side. There is just US and WS. And uh, similar uh, applies for US. Prime. So again, on the left hand side, there is US prime, but on the right hand side, there is just five, but not US, and the same for the US. And we will use this later to construct our integration scheme for these equations. I would say that the, most of the work in engineering uh, literature is based on solution of geometric exact using the triangle element method. But we decided to. Uh, to use another technique, but in fact, we would like to implement our numerical formulation into our final element problem. So, at the uh, Faculty of Civil Engineering, we are developing a code that is open source. It's called OOFEM, that stands for Object Oriented Finite Element Code. And uh, <clears throat> I will, what I will show, I will usually uh, use or I will use a displacement driven analysis. So, uh, that means that uh, when I have my finite element, I have given displacement. From displacement, I calculate strength, and from strength, I calculate internal forces and the stiffness matrix. So I will use the word element for, let's say, uh, something that gives me internal forces and stiffness matrix from uh, given displacement. Yeah. So I will use word element, but it's not finite element because usually when I say element, everyone directly thinks about the finite element. So this is just to to know that. So, in fact, if, if I go back a uh, little bit, uh, just I forgot to say, so here we have some uh, constants, integration constants, and AB, XAB, ZAB that we don't know. So, we also need somehow to, to know what are these, uh, these variables. And then we, we use a technique that we start from, from left end. We somehow estimate this XAB, ZAB, and MAB. So I will comment on it later. And then we integrate using a finite difference scheme uh, to the right hand right to obtain UB, W, UB, and phi. And because we are using this displacement driven analysis, we know 
UA and UB, W by WB. So we know these quantities and we need to uh, estimate the internal forces. So this is what would my element do. So I will give them, give the elements displacement and rotation and left and right. And I want to get uh, internal forces. And I will do it in such a way that I start with some uh, initial guess of these three quantities. And then I will integrate to the right hand to obtain UPWB and finally. And if they are they match with the prescribed quantities, I know that my left hand forces are correct. If not, I have to do something. So this is a technique we will use. And in fact, it's like special, uh, special kind of shooting method. And to, to adjust the forces and moment of left, left hand, we use Newton or something. And so again, we, we start from some values of these uh, three guys. We integrate using, uh, let's say, the G to obtain U at the right. Then we compare it with UB that is given by, by, uh, by the code that is the prescribed or it's calculated in the previous step. I avoid this, and if this is doesn't, uh, that doesn't match, I calculate some uh, correction that is you know, it has delta F and U. And I continue until the equilibrium is reached. For that, I also need to calculate uh, some minimization of, uh, of this G mapping from left end to the right end. And also, I calculate uh, the stiffness matrix to, to have a com com like complete formulation of my game. So let me just uh, show you briefly how this G look like. So we use uh, a finite difference method. So in fact, M MI is just, uh, let's say, some initialization of uh, moment at left, at left end. And then we exploit uh, the property that I mentioned that to calculate a uh, phi prime, we don't need to know phi, just U and W. Yeah? And because we know uh, U and W at the left end, we can explicitly calculate phi in the middle of the interval. And then also the normal force that is just uh, calculated using the known quantities and cosine of phi, phi i. So it's just a, let's say, auxiliary variable. But then we can use this uh, middle step phi to evaluate also explicitly u i and w i. So even though we, we use central differences, because we, we use a value of uh, n in the center of the interval and phi, uh, we, we can calculate u and w in an explicit way. And then we can continue and uh, integrate phi, let's say, in the second uh, mid step, uh, like this again, using just mi at point i, that is also known because we already know ui and wi. And we continue repeating that after. Uh, till we get to the right right uh, point of my my beam. So until we get to uh, to the right point, and then we return here. So we get to the right point. We get U B. Sorry, we have we get this U B. The estimation of U B based on the value of uh, forces at left interval. We compare it with the prescribed value of U B, and if the, let's say this this guy is not not small enough, we calculate the correction of le left hand forces and we go back here and calculate again until we get to convergence. And of course, this is iteration just at the element level. Yeah. So at the element level, from, from the given the deformation characteristic of this person, the rotation, let's say, we calculate internal forces and stiffness matrix. And then we go to the upper level where it's like in finite elements because we implement this as an element into finite element code and we assemble stiffness matrices from different elements and vector of internal forces from different elements and we uh, perform another iteration to the global level. So let me show you a first example. It is a pure bending for a cantilever beam. So we have a beam that is clamped at the left and loaded by by moment at the right. And for such a structure, we know the exact solution because uh, we know how the curvature is calculated and, and so on. So we know that this uh, uh, beam would fall in, in the shield. 
uh, even you know depends how how big M we apply, but we apply M such as we get a circle shape at the end, or it's part of a circle at, at any stage, but at the end it would be like a closed circle. And then we compare it with uh, our model using just one element and then integration segment. So we divide the element into 10 segments and we, we calculate. Uh, we have just three degrees of freedom, so two displacement and one rotation at the, at the left. Oh, sorry, at the right hand. Yeah, so this is uh, how it uh, forms. The blue blue line is the exact solution, and the red dots uh, are obtained uh, using the, this uh, element based on the sheet method. So you can see that with just one element and 10 segments, we have very good match. But let me uh, show you this table where the error gets evaluated uh, for different number of uh, segments for, for our element. So you can see that with uh, how we evaluate the error. So we, we took uh, the value of m over ei that is equal to the curvature, that is one over the radius of, of, the, of the circle we should get. And then we calculate the radius. Of the of the circle in the middle of the inter, in the middle of the beam, and based on that we have the error. And so the exact value is one, but for eight segments we get a little bit higher value. But as we uh, refine and we add more segments, we converge and clearly the convergence is quadratic. Yeah, so you can see that from ten segments to twenty segments we add uh, twice. Uh, we double the number of segments and the error is four times lower. What is also interesting is that when we compare our solution with one element and a segment with a beam element that is quite classic one and the standard one based on the work of Simon who worked from uh, 86, uh, we got exactly the same error. But this is probably a coincidence and I don't have any like. Uh, more detailed explanation why, why is that. But here, in this case, there are eight elements in, in Simon book, but they are really uh, finite elements, so much more degrees of freedom. Now, let me show you another example that is the stability of a country lever. So again, we have a, we have a country lever plant at the, at the bottom and loaded by a force at the top. And this PE is a famous Euler for Formula for critical force that at, uh, that leads to a buckling of the beam, the loss of stability and the bifurcation in of, of the uh, straight beam into uh, into buckled shape. In fact, uh, this formula assumes that beam is inextensible, and yeah? so that means that e, e a uh, goes to infinity. Yeah? So this is sometimes also assumed. That when uh, A is much, it's larger than uh, one can assume that B is inextensible and somehow uh, simplify the formulation. Uh, but to, to assume also extensibility of the beam, we derive uh, the correct formula for extensible beam. That seems that it's quite uh, different from the original formula, but when, when you take uh, some approximate model, it, it can be seen that it, it, it's, it's the right formula. And then we compare our formulation uh, whether with, with this formula, so it means that whether we are able to, to capture this critical or the buckling behavior uh, at the right critical force. And you can see, again, the number of integration segments on the one axis and somehow normalized the critical force. On the y, on the second axis, and you can see that uh, already for eight integration segments, we are quite quite close. But for sixteen or more segments, the match is almost perfect. Yeah. So we are able to capture such a behavior in these experiments. So we calculated uh, many more examples. This is uh, another one, which is so-called williams toggle It's basically the two uh, cantilevers connected in the middle, and uh, where Again, the force is applied. Williams did also uh, some experiments uh, using this uh, toggle, and he considered different different uh, side angles. 
that correspond to this two, two curve, the red one and the blue one. So we have also some experimental results that uh, are here denoted uh, by these uh, blue squares and uh, bright uh, uh, red circles. Also, we have to derive some analytical solution, but that was an exact solution, but an approximate one. But uh, even with the approximate solution, uh, the, the match is quite, quite nice here. Yeah, and you can see some uh, convergence uh, upon uh, refinement, uh, upon increasing of the segments. So you get a quite a nice and efficient formulation for straight beams, but uh, so far, uh, we can load we can load them just just in the normal area. We, we didn't introduce a distributed load along the beam, which um, might be needed in some cases. So we, we decided also to to extend the formulation and to include uh, some distributed loads. And uh, I will just mention one case, and it's a four load. So we have a load that it's uh, also dependent on the deformation. So it's not loaded. Uh, we just put there and it all, always uh, points down, but uh, it's nodes such as its directions, it's in it's in, in a direction of a normal in the different configuration. Sometimes uh, you can have a energy for this load, but not always. For, for, for example, in this case, uh, that is the big thing here, there, there would be no no energy because it's non conservative load. And uh, so we need to start for all the expressions of all variation of external forces. And uh, these two guys, they correspond to components of the normal load in the different configuration. So we can plug these contributions to, into our um, equilibrium equations and then repeat the technique. So Again, you use the same technique, just it's a little. <laughs> but, uh, but it's influenced, influenced just by, by, by the pressure. So, so the, the scheme is modified. I'm sorry, I, I don't know. I hope there will be no messages. <laughs> and then we apply it. Okay, so it's my control. So we apply it uh, to our beam. So we have this kind of uh, structure. In fact, uh, it's like checkerboard, just or the, the, the pressure is applied, like, let's say, in the checkerboard manner. So there's a section in this one uh, pressure here, pressure here, and section here. Yeah. And this is connected to design of another kind of metal materials that is connected to work of. Uh, on on the photos, uh, PhD student mine and, and Zema. Uh, I will not uh, talk about that uh, more, but I will just show that we are able to simulate uh, behavior even with uh, pressure overall. So what's happening? I will run it once again. So there is some inflation here and such and here, but Suddenly, after reach some critical pressure, there is again some loss of stability, and uh, and uh, this uh, cell somehow deform and uh, uh, move in a non-symmetric way. Now I, I will switch to another extension because uh, we have a nice and quite efficient formulation for straight beams, but then we realize that we need to help with some uh, arc or beam that it's uh, curved. That we would need a many straight elements and we would completely lose the advantage of our formulation. So we decided to extend the formulation also for cases with initial curve geometry. So you can imagine that we have some fictitious straight beam that is uh, deformed into initial stress, stress free, free state. And then it's deformed to the final deformed configuration. So, uh, so we start from the let's say straight formulation and we define functions u naught, w naught, and phi naught that transform our straight beam into this initial curve state that is stress free. But the functions cannot be arbitrary, but they, they have to satisfy this constraint that the length of the initial straight or the fictitious straight state 
and the length of the beam in this initial uh, stress free curve slide has to be the same. And this condition uh, can be expressed using uh, the relative of US prime and WS prime or not. So this uh, function that transform my initial straight state into this initial, initial curve stress free state. And we give these functions as an input to our formulation, and then again repeat the procedure. Uh, here, I would like to just mention how the stretches are defined because we already know that uh, the stretch uh, of, like, defined from, from the uh, straight state to the curved state is given by the stretch of the center line plus z times the relative of phi, so which is the curvature. We can also define stretch from the straight state into the curved one that is given as a lambda s naught plus z times phi naught prime. But what is the real stretch of my beam is the mapping from or the stretch from the curved state into the finally defined state. And this is given given by this uh, fraction, and it turns out that it's uh, what is here in the in the brackets and here, and we we need to realize that this lambda s naught is equal to one because that was our condition that the length of the beam of the uh, of the curve state is the same as the straight one. So the lambda s not it's ma mapping of the or the stretch of the center line of the straight beam to the length of the center line of the curve beam, but this, this is equal to one. So the final stretch is given by this fraction. And this somehow complicates uh, the formulation a little bit. First, uh, we again use the material law the same way as before. So it's the it's this one. Then we substitute into our strain energy, but here there is the x, but we have to add also this to express the, the length of, of the fibers in the curve configuration. Then we can again uh, use a minimum of potential energy, and we add uh, also in the uh, equation where also there is a fraction uh, where in the denominator there is one plus z times kappa naught, which is, which is the initial curvature form of the beam. So you can see that when kappa naught is equal to zero, we get uh, the original formulation. But because this is not simple linear function of z, uh, this has some consequences. And we can see that when we substitute and we calculate uh, our stress result resultants. And so we would like to integrate uh, the stress uh, over all the area. And you can see that here we have some coupling be between the strain in the center line and delta kappa, which is the curvature from the curved state to the deformed state. And so it's not the, let's say, kappa that, that denotes the curvature. Let me go, go, go back just to. I, okay, I think here. So here you can see again that uh, you know that we not and find out those from the straight fictitious configuration to the curve one, and the delta, delta y was those from the curve one to the final deformation, the form one. And, and the u, w, and phi without any substrate or delta, uh, they go from the fictitious straight beam to the final deformation. So here we have a delta kappa, and there is a coupling between the normal force and, and the bending moment or the, the coupling between the strain and uh, the curvature. So when we just bend the beam, there will be also some uh, deformation. The equilibrium equation remains, uh, remains the same. And again, uh, we, we use these three sets of equations and substitute uh, inside them and then use again the shooting method so in fact uh, nothing so so much change that we have to take into account account uh, find what we know that that will be in, in the procedure so i will not repeat the uh, integration scheme here but uh, 
I will show you that I took some animal for examples. Yeah. It's just well known that the, uh, the finite element method in modeling of curved structures leads to so called uh, membrane blocking. Yeah. So, probably, you know, for example, volumetric blocking from from uh, for almost incompressible or incompressible materials, but this is like a structural kind of blocking that is uh, present for curved uh, slender structures. And uh, I put here a table from paper from 1983 that was one of the first papers that uh, show the membrane blocking in curved elements. And the problem of the blocking of uh, or the manifestation of the blocking is that the structure behaves too stiff. So somehow it's called locking because it locks against the deformations. And you can see that, for example, if they took a full integration of a standard element, eight element, curved element, they got a value of uh, 1300 over 942. Yeah, so it was uh, really too stiff. And then there are some techniques how to, how to solve this locking, but in fact, this is just for small strength elements in large strength formations with a bit more involved. But we were just interested whether, whether we would be able to get locking free behavior or not. In fact, what, what the values are, they are just values of initial stiffness. So the stiffness at, at like the start of, without any deformation. So one point is that this exact analytical value we provided is not correct. Uh, it's a little bit different. So we derived a little bit different value because our, our elements uh, converge to different values. So we were like thinking what, what the reason is, and then we, we found out that the exact analytical solution is a little bit different from what they reported. So you can see again that, uh, in fact, the structure looks like this. Because it's symmetric, so it's possible to use again just just one element. So we use again just one element, a different number number of integration segments, and to be nicely converge uh, to the initial stiffness uh, to the analytical value from below. So we have no okay. We also try to use like uh, two elements, so we get uh, we we get very very nice solution as well that is consistent with the one element. It just depends on the total number of integration segments. Yeah. So in fact, uh, if we, if we, okay, so here we just look at, at the stiffness. But another manifestation of membrane locking, it's in the oscillations of normal forces. So you can see, again, this is a recent paper uh, where they use uh, isogeometric analysis. So the nerves are basis functions for the finite elements. They use 10 isogeometric element with different uh, degree of uh, polynomial. So it's like a degree 2, 3, 4, 8, 10, and 15. And you can see that up to 10, they have like very wide oscillation in normal force. Only for P equal to 15, they have, uh, let's say, locking free behavior. So we were interested also in the being we, we able to get a uh, Locking free behavior for for our formation. Okay, here you can see also the deformation of this structure. And, but here you can see again the distribution of normal force along the along the length of the beam, and uh, we compare for different number of integration segments. So already for four segments, of course the, the solution is not uh, accurate enough, but there is no case. So for us, uh, it's completely locking free. And when we refine again, we get better and better solution. Uh, I just put here the their solution for P equal to 15. So we can comp compare the volume. So in the middle, there is something like minus 0 0.012, which is uh, which is this value here. And uh, at, at the boundaries, uh, they have also value that is, uh, that is uh, similar to ours. So we have completely looking free formulation. Or also, just to mention that this plot of normal forces is calculated at, at the peak of, of this whole displacement curve. It's not that important that it's normal in the end point. This is another benchmark. 
is a circle arch that it's a clamp at the right and simply support it at the left and hold it by force in the middle. And you, I also report two different uh, different values using different techniques. So similar would work. We could see this uh, for, for the first example. So they reported the value that corresponds to the critical value. But what when there's a this uh, snap through instability. It is equal to 0 0.5 times EI over R squared. But in fact, the report in Schmidt, it's usually the, this work is uh, referred to as an analytical solution for this problem. But in fact, it's not an analytical solution, it's some kind of numerical solution, but very precise one. Yeah? So everyone would like to get as close as possible to the solution, and you can see that uh, we, we have again made this match. In fact, here we use, use just two elements because there is a force in the middle. So we divide it, uh, and we are not able to, to handle like uh, force, uh, do, which is in, in the middle or somewhere in, in our integration uh, interval. So we divide this uh, structure just into two elements. So that there are just, let's say, three degrees of freedom in, in the middle and one on the left. So we have just four degrees of freedom to solve such kind of structures. While, for example, similar would go to use something like uh, 50, 60 elements. OK, so this is uh, another example to show you the coupling between the normal force uh, and the bending moment. So we could see in, in the first example that we were holding Continue into a circle, and now I will do a reverse and I will unfold the circle. So we have a cantilever that is uh, cut here, in fact, and the bending moment is applied, and I would like to unfold it. And I use two formulations. One is using the correct equations, including coupling, and the second one is without the coupling. And you can uh, so. So sorry, so the blue one is with coupling and the red one is without coupling. Yeah? So at the beginning, it seems as we very close, but then after we continue and continue, uh, the difference is bigger and bigger. And uh, what, what would I, I would like to point out that uh, for the coupling, there is uh, some uh, compression on the beam. And also what is interesting that if we use a straight elements and we simulate this uh, simple shape of straight elements, we get exactly what we got with this formation without the coupling. So with straight elements, we are not able to simulate this curved structures properly. Of course, this effect can be neglected for many cases, but not always. And one has to pay attention to, to know whether it's possible to neglect it or not. But in general, we can somehow evaluate uh, whether this coupling is important or not. And if it is important, then we need to use uh, theory based on curved, curved beam and not the one based on the straight one. So this is just a note to, to tell you. Also, so far, I used or I show all the examples based on the circular shape, but we <coughs> extend our beams also and compare some. Different shapes like the parabolic, parabolic beam. We compare it uh, by with with, uh, with results from this paper, and you can see again that we have a very good match. Uh, we we consider two values of this H parameter. Uh, for the first one, it's a quite a, let's say standard behavior. Of course, this is displacement driven analysis because if we prescribe the force, then we just get some. A snap through behavior and jump from this top point somewhere here and then we will continue further. But if we prescribe displacement, we can we can match or we can we, we can fit all, all the points. But if we increase the age, we, we double it. I don't give you the exact exact values, uh, but we can find them in, in our papers. Uh, the behavior of, of the structure is much more complicated and it manifests so called loop. Okay? That you can see that the, when we load the structure, we continue to the P, and there is some so softening for that. There will be like snap through again if we use uh, all this all dream analysis. Uh, but then there is this uh, loop, but there is this uh, 
snapback. So even if we use displacement driven analysis, we wouldn't be able to capture the whole four displacement curve because here at this point it would probably be just half. So it was again it would be some kind of instability. But we use arc line formulation, so we were able to capture all the cones uh, on the four displacement curve and we got a very nice match of our element or in fact here we use again just one element yeah, because uh, we consider just a symmetric structure uh, because it was exactly what was done in this paper. Also, we tried some more fancy examples like a logarithmic spiral. So we have a spiral uh, that is uh, radius is given by, by this equation. So it's like increasing radius uh, with, uh, with, with phi. And uh, so that would be really complicated to describe but by some straight lines. And again, this is just one element and we can, you know, use uh, different number of integration segments by uh, Also, what is uh, interesting is that uh, the formulation can be applied to also to structures that are not curved, but that there is some kind of chunk, for example, here, here uh, in, in terms of uh, rotation. So we have something like spring, and here this is again just one element. Okay? And what we give the element, it's again the function of uh, phi naught, uh, and then we know that, that, that there are chunks in different intervals, yeah. And because we evaluate the phi only in the middle of the interval, so it's very straightforward to, to, to do it. So again, there is some kind of uh, instability. So we compress the, the spring, and then suddenly it comes out of the bubbles, and uh, we derive also. Uh, some analytical solution that is very, very close to, to the value of the critical force uh, that we calculated uh, based on this analysis. Okay, so the last extension is related to what I showed you at the beginning, and it's this contact behavior of uh, hexagons with some internal, internal structure. Because this is really what we would like to simulate, and all I showed you uh, that it's like you know leading to the final goal and the simulation of these kind of structures. Yeah. So this is just to remind you. And uh, here we decided uh, to to really to have like uh, efficient formulation. We decided that we we will uh, we, we will uh, handle this contact internet. So again. Here we see two beams that can get into contact, but for, for us, it's, let's say macroscopic scale, this would be just one beam, and the contact would be solved internally in the integration shooting method formulation. So just some notation here. So I have this uh, contact part, okay, the length between the endpoints is L and B, and the length of the, these two different contiguous is L A and L B. And then I have a tip points with denoted as a C. And then when I look from the tip point to the plant end, on the right it's called A and on the left it's called B. Yeah, so this is why this is switched here and here, because here I look from C to, to here, and I see on the right is A and on the left is B. But here I look from C to this plant end, and again on the left is A, B, and on the right is A. And then we identify different mechanisms in contact. So for example, and we, we gave them a code. Yeah. So for example, AA means that there is contact of surface A of the left B with the surface A of the right B. So you can see that this surface is in contact with this surface. So we have AA, BB. So this is basically uh, the same of reverse. But then we have also BA and a B so means that uh, this bottom surface of uh, B is in contact is bottom surface A so it looks like looks like this and we have also four thick contacts um, cases where one or the other tips are in contact with with uh, surface A or surface B and then with N we did no no contact case. 
Okay. So we, because we, we would like to handle this uh, internally, we have some additional uh, degrees of freedom inside uh, this beam. And for different contact modes, we have different, different uh, unknowns, new unknown variables. It's either delta phi, which is the difference between uh, phi of one and, and the second beam, but also unknown length of, of left or right beam, and depending on, on the mode. So let me let me show you as a specific example of type CB. So it's a thick contact on the tip of the left beam with the beam surface of the right beam. So it looks like this. And for this case, we know what is delta phi. Oh, sorry. So we know what is the, uh, what is LA because it's the full length of this uh, first beam, but we don't know what is the length from the right end of the second beam to the contact point. And we also don't know what is the delta phi. So what is the difference between the relation between these two these two beams? And we have certain conditions that uh, has to be satisfied. Uh, there are compatibility conditions in this case that uh, increment of UCB, so displacement at the contact point uh, of this one, has to be the same. So that they have to move, move together in the, in the contact. The, the same uh, is uh, for the W. So, of course, in the beginning, uh, they deform differently, they, they have different displacement, but when they get into contact, and they continue and deform together. Yeah? And then we have some jump conditions. So the first, first one, it's a jump in the rotations, and then we have a jump in the normal force and shear, shear force. So this, this is basically some kind of equilibrium. And then uh, we can have different uh, modes. We can have sticking or we can have sliding for this case. Yeah? So this is a, let's say, I would say a classic formulation that is in, in this form of a conductor condition. So we have a function that tells us whether we are in the sticking or whether we are in the sliding case. Uh, of course, whether when, when FC is uh, smaller than zero, it's sticking, and when FC is equal to zero, it's sliding. And when it's sliding, uh, this lambda dot has to be positive, and uh, this is the complementary condition. And then we can calculate the uh, the, let's say difference of LCB uh, using using this equation. But uh, just to to be more specific, I choose the case uh, when we have a sticking because it's uh, let's say quite simple. And in this case, LBC is known because uh, we know where, where the point of contact is and it's it sticks there. So we know also the, the length of of this guy. And then we can use, uh, if I go back, just we, we can use this compatibility conditions uh, to, to find uh, the left hand forces. So here it looks quite uh, complicated because uh, we have uh, different variables. But in fact, here what we do is that we shoot from the left and we shoot from the right and we want to meet in the middle. So again, we shoot shooting method, but a little bit uh, modified. So here is U, it's U here, and we shoot from the left and we, we get to this point. Yeah? And then on the right, we shoot from the right and we get from the from this point. But to shoot from the right, we, we need to know FBA. But FBA can be calculated from FAB and uh, using the equilibrium. So in fact, uh, we can express this FBA using FAB and then LBC, LAB, uh, the FB, they are all known. So again, it's like a shooting method where we shoot from two, two ends and we would like to meet them in, in, the, in the contact point. Of course, we also handle other kind of contact, also including uh, this uh, sliding case. And, uh, I have just one simple example to show you. So I have two beams. Let's imagine that there are just these two beams in the middle of the hexagon. Okay. 
But here, in fact, we prescribed uh, we prescribed the displacement at the end, and we just test uh, the behavior of the of the shooting algorithm. Yeah. So there are not like global iterations, yeah. and you can see that we have different modes of contact. So the this is the thick contact, the thick mode I I show you, but there is also some movement of, of the so the second one. So this is still a work in progress. Uh, uh, I'm working now on the hexagon, so I hope that soon we will have also simulation on the, of the hexagon, including the contact and the movements, the amounts of the contact. Yeah. So just to conclude my presentation, so I show you uh, <coughs> formulation of geometric normal in a green based on the shooting method. And uh, also some kind of extensions using the uh, including the pressure, pressure load, uh, curve initial geometry, and internal B to B contact. And also, we'd like to extend it uh, to include shear. So, to go beyond this uh, Navier Bern hypothesis, to extend it to 3D, and also maybe to some physics uh, like uh, moment elasticity or uh, soft materials with hard magnetic uh, behavior. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the interesting question. The question is the question. So so you told us that in not nine cases of contact, right? I mean, this is, is of course a little bit simplified, at least if I'm allowed to modify to do to, 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 to deform these beams, whatever I like. For instance, I can create several points of contact. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you think these, these, these cases are simply not relevant as to model the mountains in French? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, it's like related when you look at this, you know, that they are really. You know, this beam wouldn't be like really different because the structure would be like loaded from, from, from the outside. Yeah. So you can see that uh, this beams more or less, uh, you know, you can see the like modes, they don't like create really curved uh, geometry. So I think this is not really relevant for our case. Yeah. Maybe second. Um, so, so when you then start to see like these mm -hmm. constructs, I mean, how 